Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Let's start with a question. What's the first area that you focus on and what's the first things that you do? If you happen to notice that your revenue and your patient visits were down a little bit, most of us in this situation turn directly towards how do I go about getting in more newies? Now, my guest on the show this week tells us that that's only one of three things that we should be focusing on. And when we focus on that one thing alone, it's often the reason why we're not seeing results. My guest is the amazing Dr. Billy Chow. Now, he's returning all the way back from episode 58. He's one of my dearest friends. Uh, He was the MC at my wedding. I'm the godfather of his beautiful son, Harrison. Now, Billy is a chiropractor. He's a coach, a mentor. He has a really unique background in that not only, uh, as I said, is he a chiropractor, but he's worked for a long time in the financial services industry as well, so and on boards. So he really understands some of the behind the scenes things that go on with us trying to run a practice. Now, the three things that we need to be focusing on are, yes, one of them is actually how do we bring more new people in? The second thing we talk a lot about is this onboarding process. Are we making the most of the people that are coming to us? And then the third thing we talk about is retention. Now, when we nail all three of these, the chance of our revenue increasing, the chance of our uh, patient visits increasing goes up drastically as well. This is a really fabulous conversation. It's a really mature conversation as well. For many of us, the concept that Billy kind of directs us towards this idea of what hats do we wear? And when we started, I know for me, when I started out as a chiropractor, the only hat that I thought that I would have to wear is the hat of helping patients. I thought if I just focused on helping people, you know, this concept I talk about inside the interview a little of helping sick people get well, that's all I needed to do. When in actual fact, I need to think about HR and employing staff, managing people. I need to think about accounting and bookkeeping. In marketing and in terms of increasing revenue and patient numbers, it's not just as simple as more new patients as well. I think you're going to love this episode. Let's jump in and talk to the amazing Billy Chow. Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast, where we guide natural health and wellness experts through the pitfalls of marketing. Each episode, you'll learn simple, effective, easily actionable, and heart-centered marketing strategies. And here's your host, Angus Pike. Dr. Billy Chow, welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. How are you, brother? I'm very well, Angus. Once again, I'm always excited to see your beautiful face and also get to talk to you. Yeah, buddy, I'm, I've decided that today I'm going to start these episodes off uh, in a new way from now. And I'm going to test something okay. over the next six or eight episodes as well. All right. Yeah. I'm interested in this too. Um, yep. I'm going to get you to share two of your most recent favorite books one of which, and they don't even have to be recent, they can be of all time there too. I want a nonfiction book that you've read, and then I want your favorite kind of business marketing book as well. Let's start with that first. What's your favorite business marketing book that you've read of all time or recently? Oh, gee, that's a hard one. A you can start with one. a nonfiction if you want to begin with that. Um, well, okay, so uh, a nonfiction um, it's, it's hard because I haven't read many, many non-fictions recently. And then yes. the ones that most recently I've read, I can't remember. But, the, but one of the most memorable non-fiction books I've ever read mm. was The Beach. You know, the, 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 um, the book that was then made into a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. That's right. probably like if I, if I had to, it's one of those sort of non-fiction books that has always kind of like, that's always like the one that comes up straight away. Yeah. I've seen recently on your feed that you were reading Matthew McConaughey's yeah, kind of yeah. autobiography. I guess yes. that's not really nonfiction. Yeah, that's why I didn't say that because it's yeah. sort of, it's, yeah. It's, Tricky. Because um, I was, because, yeah, because, um, I, yeah, I, like we were chatting the other day and it's a, it's kind of autobiography slash self-help slash, slash sort of Texan McConaughey philosophy. Yeah. And yeah, I've enjoyed it. I, I finished it just a couple of days ago. And I definitely believe that it's a good read for any person, you know, whether they're male or female, whether they like him or not. Um, it's just got some really cool things. And it, it kind of it goes into a lot, a lot of the stuff that, you know, what made him into a star and, and, um, and how, like, you know, and something even for myself to reflect on how, like, it, like one thing that came up was that he had unwavering um, you know, sort of, you know, his foundations of how he got brought up and, you know, his beliefs and, and how he sort of, you know, how he went about life, regardless of whether it was money or fame or, you know, women and that kind of stuff. He always had like an un- unwavering kind of set of rules that he lived by. And I, and I thought that was cool. Yeah. 
I listened to a podcast episode with he and Dax Shepard on, on mm. the Dax Shepard's podcast there too. Yeah. And some of the stories are wild. Yeah. Like I didn't realize yeah. that he had had a year exchange here in Australia. Yes. Yeah. He told yeah. the story about the wacky family that he was yeah. with uh, there and some of his shenanigans. Yeah. So what about if we get a little bit more kind of tactical inside marketing, business, yeah. that kind of stuff? Have you got a favorite there that you've read or one that's, you know, on your mind more uh, of recent? Yeah, I'll grab, grab it quickly. Go for it. I'll, um, I'll, I'll fill in time here. I was going to say I'll sing, but I won't do that. This book here. Oh, okay. It's called Getting a Fucking Grip is what it is. So sorry if you've got kids in the car while I yep. said that too. And the subtitle was How to Get Your Life Back on Track. So yeah. Matthew Kimbley, never heard of Matthew it. Matthew Kimbley. Yeah, you've never, oh, I'll, I'll have to introduce you. You'll have to get him on. Right. Yeah. Tell, me, tell yeah. me about Matthew and tell me about the book. Um, I met Matthew Kimberley because he was one of our speakers that we had um, at an event that we hold called Summer Camp. Yes. Um, if you if you look up Matthew Kimberley, you'll notice that he is connected with a lot of your friends. Like you know, he's he yep. he's worked with Taki Moore. Um, you know, he's he's friends with uh, a lot of people we know. He is a he runs um, the Michael Port Book Your Solid Book Yourself uh, Solid System. So he um, and he coaches uh, you know people with, through that system. Yes. Um, he uh, he's an amazing salesman. Um, great at sales. Fantastic at sales. And you know he he's um and because he's English, he's got that. You know, I mean, you 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 and I being Australian, we can kind of understand that sort of you know that that comedy and that sort of fun that he has. He he makes words sound sexy, like you know, because obviously he's British and um, yeah. but also he he um he lives he lives the that kind of remote lifestyle entrepreneur where he and his wife and his two kids are in Malta, um, and he takes and he has you know his clients all over the world. So yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to keep connect you with uh, Matt. He's a nice I'd chap. Yeah. What, were there a couple of key things out of that that you learned that stood out for you? Uh, Listen, so it's, it's written in a way that you could open up any chapter, regardless of whether it's the back or the front. Um, the, there's one that actually talks about that, um, for what one, one clearly is about kids, about sort of, you know, raising children. Um, and, he, and he talks about how, look, you know, that there's, at the end of the day, it's like, it, like, you know, we, we, we marshmallow our kids so much these days. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we, we want to do this for them and that, and, and, and like, you know, it's, and, you know, we have to start to look at what's really important. Is is it important to make sure that Johnny and 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 and, and Sophia, you know, uh, get everything taken care of, or is it actually that they learn the vital sort of important, you know, like like um, experiences throughout life, so they can then grow up and then also become parents themselves and you know go out into the world. So, you know, I, I'm being quite reflective, you know, in my in my aging years, but I I kind of I like those things now. Yeah. Isn't that one of the biggest challenges? What well, is for me of parenting is mm. I feel like each generation of parents, we want to kind of um, make up for the mistakes that we thought that our parents did with us yeah. and, and improve upon it, which is natural and normal. But it's funny how when I look back in my life, the biggest challenges that I've had have also been the greatest gifts that I have. And so therefore, if I try to um, herd my family, my kids away from having to have those challenges. I'm also robbing them from the things that will bring about resilience and character and all those kind of things. It, it's mm. that concept through there. I think about really often, um, and it's something that I, I, I really don't have uh, a hold on as well. Or well, Matthew Kimberley, yeah. and um, that's a book that I look forward to kind of chasing up from that yeah. too. Yeah. Now today, <clears throat> this is a round two for us as, as well. We're um, when I talk about this concept, you and I were chatting about it the other day, often as small businesses, which is what we are. And, mm -hmm. you know, you might even be a small business of one of your associate yeah. working for another chiropractor, naturopath as, as well. Sometimes the only hat that we feel like we have on is the chiropractor hat, the naturopath, mm -hmm. the, the Chinese med hat on too. When in fact, for us to have impact in our community, influence in our community, for us to yeah. have a, a nice predictable income, there are many hats that we need to wear and understanding what those hats are, when we need to wear them, when we need to take them off can be uh, incredibly important and valuable for us mm -hmm. uh, you know, running a successful business as well. You coach a bunch of practitioners and you brought this concept up to me the other day. So you want to share a little bit about some of the conversation you've been having and yeah. how you've been able to share? Yeah. I mean, you're exactly right. Like, you know, as, as healthcare practitioners and professionals owning our business, and as you say, you know, we could either be a, a solo practitioner or an associate, or we could have a team. It, regardless of how Small or how big a team, 
we are no different to big corporations. Like, you know, and, and you know, when you and I are talking, I was saying like, no different to say Apple Computer or IBM or Ford Motor Company. I mean, like those, I mean, we look at those companies and we go, they've got, and we've, we've probably got friends and, and partners and, and you, know, um, you know, people that we know that work in those big corporates and they might be in the marketing department or they might be in the sales department or they might be in the procurement or the, the R&D department. And if, you, and if you kind of think about us as small practitioners, that we, um, regardless of how small we are, we still have those departments. It's just that as, you know, as a small business, we have to wear all of those hats. You know, so we all, we have to wear, you know, the marketing department hat, and then we're going to take that off. And then we're going to put on the sales department. And then if we're hiring staff, then we're going to like, you know, go to the back and grab the HR cap. Um, and then, you know, when everything's all finished, when the shift's finished, then we've got to put on the, the, the janitor or the, um, or the, the cleaners hat and do that as well, especially if we are just a, a team of one. Um, and so, you know, like, I think that that's a, like, first of all, for any of any of the people who listen to your podcast, um, that to understand that understanding those departments and having, you know, that concept, regardless of whether you have to wear them all, that's a really powerful thing to understand, because then by understanding whether your departments are, um, which departments you have in your business, you can see whether they're efficient or effective. And like Apple, um, you know, each department has to has to pull their weight. You know, they all have to, you know, like, so, you know, back when well, it's Tim, it's Tim Cook, but back when Steve Jobs was alive, you know, that he, he wouldn't want to make sure that the marketing department, the sales department, the R&D department, they're all, all working effectively and efficiently, not just the, the marketing department. So that's, a, that was a concept we were, we were talking about. Um, and it, when it comes to small business, you know, when we look at metrics, uh, most of us, we tend to just look at two things. Uh, and you'd probably agree with this for a lot of your clients that, um, they look at at the end of the week or at the end of the month, how many clients or patients they saw and how much revenue they, they took. Yeah. All right? yeah. And when things are going well, you know, like if week to week and month to month, which doesn't happen, but if it, if it hypothetically did, then you, most people would probably go, that's cool. Like, you know, if, if this month I took, you know, 20 grand and then next month I took 25 and then the following month I took 35 and the next month I took 35 again. And the next month I took 40, you'd be like, Hunky dory, like you know, there's there's no need to worry. But as you know, in reality, that doesn't happen. And especially when things like, I mean, like this doesn't happen often, and we don't want it to happen often. But like the pandemic, um, like yeah, recessions, yeah, um, possibly things like you know, um, you know, for many many people in Australia, like in in healthcare, um, marketing and advertising restrictions and those things, and we have to pivot. And then what can happen is that we look at our month and maybe. This month we took 35 grand and then next month we took 20. Okay, that's, that's a big drop. And then the following month we see, we see 20 and then the following month we see 15 and we're like, what, what do we do? And, we've, and if we only look at those metrics, often what happens, and you probably already, you know, you could answer this, that most of us go, we need more leads. We want new, new patients or new clients. We need, to, we need to try and boost, you know, the new clients. And that's only one department of your business. Um, and so like... Um, you know, I, 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 I sort of kind of like, I mean, you can have as many departments as possible. I think having these three departments uh, are critical for any business. And that is yeah. number one, lead generation and marketing department. So that's the department that you kind of uh, put, uh, you know, in there, all the procedures, all the things, all the things that you do that happen for your business that, you know, expose your business you know, engage the public, brand, websites, advertising, all that kind of stuff that you do before they even interact with you to make an appointment to come in. Okay. Yep. And then the next department I say through the through the client journey is the new client or new patient onboarding and processing. So that's kind yep. of once they've made contact with you, and that's whether they via a, a like a like a, a sign up for a you know on a landing page or it could be you know at a, an online appointment or a phone call. It's from then that's when that department clicks in. And then the, and then up until you convert them into a client, you convert them right. into a patient. So they start care. And then a very big, but very general third department is uh, what I would say, like the relationship building slash retention department. And so that's kind of once they're in your practice, in your business, you know, what are you, what are you doing to obviously build that relationship, um, foster that relationship 
uh, you know, retain that client over the long run, um, mm. how to increase, you know, their lifetime value for you, how to get referrals from them, all that kind of stuff. And then, so going back to those metrics that I started off with, if you only think about, okay, the, the solution is new clients or, or marketing, um, you can really sort of lose the sight of where some of those inefficiencies in that business can be happening. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I get it. So for yeah. most people, when they're wanting to increase, you know, we go back to the number of clients they're seeing per month and the revenue, they focus just really on the first of those departments, which is lead generation marketing department. You know, how yeah. do I get yeah. exposed to more people? Do I need a new yeah. website? Do I need some Facebook ads? And just yeah. help me make some videos, those kind of things there too. Yeah. And they're not addressing, could the problem actually be, you know, what kind of a job am I doing at, um, I really, I, I wish there was an, the word that comes to mind that we often use is how yeah. good am I at converting that lead yeah. to a patient there too. Yeah. But it, it seems so kind of transactional, but let's mm. use that word until I can think yeah. of another one there too. And yeah. then we've got this process of, you know, what's your retention like? Yeah. You know, if the bucket is got full of holes and we're yeah. tipping patients into it, even if it's yeah. just three or four a month, if they're falling all the way through, then there are other departments that clearly need to be worked on as much, if not more than the lead generation. Is that a fair summary? Absolutely. And that's why, you know, uh, having good metrics and a, and a hold on your stats and, and taking good sort of like, you know, um, you know, information based on what you're doing through those departments is really vital for like a successful business. And so, you know, if you like, so you might find that like in that, in that example, that uh, with the revenue going down, it might not be, the stats might show that you're getting heaps of leads. It might be that, you know, that Angus Pike's like, you know, doing his job and like there's heaps of leads and you're making those videos and you're engaging and you're doing all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the, you're not, you're, you know, like for, as I said, for a better you know, word that we could use, but like, you know, for this, for the, for the sake of this um, uh, explanation, converting them. So you're not converting them into, into um, you know, paying staying clients. Um, or it could be that that's happening but the, the, the reason the downturn is because you're, you're that leaky bucket so that, yes, your new clients and you're converting them into, into, into care is generating income, mm. but you're losing a lot of that sort of retention income and that sort of, you know, that sort of value, lifetime value income that happens with ha having people stay on track with their care, um, you know, making sure that, you know, if they're, if they're a physiotherapy client or a chiropractic client or any kind of healthcare client that they, they're staying in, you know, on, you know, uh, under your care with some form of, you know, sort of like recommendations so that they don't kind of relapse or, you know, if they're on some sort of kind of, you know, wellness sort of type of care. Yeah. Mm. I, I can still remember the moment that I decided that I wanted to be a chiropractor. Mm. And when I think back from that moment, and I think through five years of university, then, you know, as far as my brain was aware, there was one department and it was the department of me helping patients. Like that was yeah. it. That's yeah. all I thought I needed yeah. to do. In fact, I, it, and not only did I think that, that there was often a mantra around at different seminars I would go to that all you really need to do is help sick yeah. people get well and the yeah. rest will look after itself. And it's, um, you know, it would make a nice line for a movie or a book or something like that. But in practical experience to 20 years of kind of doing this, there needs to be a heck of a lot more. You know, I, mm. I, I've lost count of the number of practitioners who I know who are really good at what they do, but they struggle because yeah. they don't know how to train staff, hire staff, fire staff. Exactly. You know, they get overwhelmed with the accounting, with the marketing, with the management, all of those kind of things there too. Yeah. How do you go about working out when you're having a conversation with a new coaching client and they're saying to you, look, the first thing, Billy, I want to work on is my revenue is down and my numbers are down there too. And, I want to see some more peeps and I want to make some more money. Yeah. Um, how do you go about an audit of knowing if we just stick with those three, is it lead generation? Is it onboarding? Is it retention? How do you find where the biggest leak is? Well, um, that's a great question. And often it, it, it requires some kind of time and, and a process. So, um, and a lot of these things uh, often it's, you know, they're, they're, they're not sort of like blatantly alarmingly there. You kind of have to dive a little bit deeper. So one thing that you can you can get people to do, and I get people to do, is to give me um, and you can, and be as descriptive and like you know the more the better of of the client journey. 
Okay, so for obviously you, you don't you can't have the client journey at the lead generation and marketing, but with that you can just tell me what you're doing. You know, like so, what pillars of your marketing um, department do you have? Do you, is it just the website? Um, but do you have any kind of organic sort of like you know marketing, or do you and do you have any paid marketing? Um, mm. Do you have do you do screenings? Do you do talks? Do you do any of those things? Um, so let's have a look at that. then from the moment they interact with you. What's the, what is that client patient journey like every interaction? So, you know, like what happens when um, a staff uh, answers the phone? Uh, if you if you are the only person, you, you are also the receptionist CA, um, you know, person as well as the chiropractor or as well as the practitioner. You know, what do you say? You know, how, what do you do? And then from the moment they come in. Um, you know, what happens, the paperwork, what do you, how do you, you know, and then, and then what happens on that visit? And so all the way, and I kind of, and, it, and, and that's why it does take time. But if we can have a look at where some of the gaps are, and I always say, like, one of the foundational tenets I have with coaching, and that is that I, I tell people, I would, I, I, the, sometimes the easiest thing to fix can actually generate the biggest kind of gain. Like we, we often look at, you know, where's the biggest gap? Like, you know, where's the biggest problem? And I kind of like go, oh, well, maybe we should have a look at, you know, somewhere that where the smallest gaps are, because maybe if we fix some, a lot of those small gaps, they end up, you know, all adding up to a bigger gain. Um, so it could be that along the patient journey, there might be some things that could be more efficient and effective. So that's, to answer your question, yeah, we'd have to kind of go through and have a look at what happens. Um, and then even beyond, so once someone starts care, once you've given them your recommendations and they're like, yep, yeah, that's cool, I'm going to start care, um, then what happens? Like, you know, do you, is it that's it? Like, do you kind of go, that's it? Like, they come to their appointments, they pay me, and if they fall off, I give them a call, and if they don't come back, then that's it. Yeah, so... Got it. Can yeah. we perhaps go through each of those three and yeah. maybe pick out one or two of the common mistakes that you see that, you know, when you're asking these kind of questions, these are things that often come up inside of lean generation in terms of onboarding, you know, yeah. the, the ones that are more common. Yeah. Um, so with, with lead generation um, and marketing, I think that what happens is that, oh, you know, one of the, one of the inefficiencies I see in a lot of people is that they, they don't stick with it. They're not consistent. Yeah. 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 And then also, I mean, it, this sounds so like I'm like, I, I'm not a, a, a marketing, um, a marketing firm. So I don't get paid to do, do people's marketing. So I can sort of say this. Um, a lot of people think that like, you know, like that I oh, look like I'll, I'll do it for a few months. I'll pay someone to do it for a few months. And then, then that's cool. And then that should, you know, reap me the benefits. And I'm like, no, like, you know, yeah, like you have to stick with it and you know both organically and also paid like if you're you know like it's it's really it's really uh, like you know even companies as i say like apple and those guys they still put money into marketing they still pay millions of dollars for ads Damn you right. know like yeah. you know they're a trillion dollar business i mean they don't stay oh we're a trillion dollar business let's stop our marketing they still market um there's that and then also uh being creative and sometimes getting out of your comfort zone uh, to include more than just a few pillars of your marketing. So like, you know, if, if traditionally you have a website that has maybe a sign up page, um, then maybe look at, you know, what kind of kind of ethical, you know, we call it like an ethical bribe or some sort of like lead generation thing that you could provide on there. It could be, um, you know, like access to some videos that they can learn about stretching or something about, you know, what they can, they can get, um, or it could be, you know, um, some sort of PDF they get as well, or even just, you know, get, giving them a, you know, access to your Facebook VIP group or, you know, so they can sort of see what's going, goes on behind the doors at your, in your business, um, that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, you know, if you you know talks all that kind of stuff. So there's multiple things when it comes to marketing lead generation. So they're the, that's that's that department. When it comes to converting, um, look, probably like improving your friction to transaction. All right. So you know, and that is that we we like it's we sometimes get stuck in our ways of how we go about doing things. So. Hey, you're like, um, hi, I want to book an appointment to see Dr. Angus. Oh, yeah, you know, Dr. Angus sees new clients on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I can't come in on Tuesday or Thursday. You know, like, you know, like, like it's like, so, you know, could, could you, could you maybe give them a call and sort of say, hey, could we set up a Zoom call? Could we, could I, could I, 
could could Dr. Angus um, actually give you a call later on today if you have some time where it can actually spend maybe 15 minutes on the phone to you, go through some things with you. Um, that can fast track us. See, number one, see if you're the right fit for us. Um, answer any questions, any concerns you have. Maybe even start the process and sort of see how we can help you. Like it's sort of, you know, like how can we get that client to transact with us easy and easier rather than kind of having set rules? You know, in 2020, there are so many things we can use and, uh, and we have so much competition. Like, you know, um, you know like we, we hate to say this, that if they're, not, if they're not a warm referral, if they're not someone that definitely wants to see Dr. Angus, um, then they may be just sort of shopping around on Google. And if they call you and they can't get in, but you don't give them another solution, like, hey, look, you know, we do have these times that we set for new clients, but, you know, we're more than happy to, you know, to, for the doctor to actually give you a buzz or for the, you know, for the health practitioner to give you a buzz just to find out what's going on. Uh, maybe if, even if you want, we can set up a Zoom, a really quick Zoom. So you can be face to face. Um, we can sort of see what's going on there. You know, having that sort of like, you know, flexibility in 2020 is really important. Mm. I've done, um, I, was, I was talking yeah. about this exact thing with um, a friend of ours, Martin Harvey, recently. Mm. And Martin used to do a lot of his new patients. Every new patient that would call in, he would do a phone consult with them first yeah. to begin the relationship with them to also find out whether they're kind of in the right place. But it be, it's there's a wow factor when your doctor yeah. kind of gets on the phone and mm. calls you beforehand. Yeah. And I've done it many times, but more by... Um, it's not a mistake that in many cases, if a patient will say to me, hey, listen, I've got a friend at work who I think needs to come and see you. My mm. go-to with that always is to try and take control of the situation. And yeah. I will go, fabulous. Why don't we see if we can get on the phone and I'll work out if I'm the right person for them or if I can help yeah. them somewhere else. And they will yeah. invariably say, wow, you would do that. And when I can begin that relationship on the phone, mm. I basically just take a basic history, gives us a chance to start to kind of build a relationship and then invariably when they end up, if it's appropriate in the practice, that initial consultation takes half the time. We've already got the ball. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It, it, and I can do yeah. that out of hours, you know, because I'm, I'm, mm. I'm not in practice a lot now. I don't, I don't have a lot of space for new patients and I'm going to go exactly back to this so I can half my new patient yeah. time and do half of it on the phone there too. I love that. And that's yeah. the concept where you talked about decreasing the friction to transaction, which is basically yeah. this how hard are we making it for people to do business with us? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, you know, it, it is that wow factor. Number one, like um, not, I mean, like we, as chiropractors, we'd always historically said that, you know, that we, 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 we were the, you know, one of the only professions that, you know, that did those calls. I'm, I'm sure that there's lots of people do them now, but I still think it's a wow because the average person, looking for and and, and it could you could even be a mortgage broker or it could be you could be an accountant that does that it's any kind of service-based industry can do it if you give them a call um you know and then you know ask them a few things uh find out what's going on use it as a pre-qualification because that they may not be the right person for you anyway they could be you know looking for someone to you know for if they've got a, a gammy toe or something and you don't do toes or you don't do feet you might go hey um, look, I've, and this is the thing going, actually, I'm jumping, I'm jumping to a different thing. And that is, you know, relationships over revenue. And that is, it's kind of like, if you do see, if you do speak to someone and they're not the right fit for you, the best thing for you to do is go, Hey, Hey, hey Angus, look, um, it sounds like that you better, yeah, it might be better off that you talk to a, a great colleague of mine. He's in my, he's in my kind of like sort of collaborative partnership that I, I deal with a lot of different practitioners. He's a podiatrist. His name's Peter. Um, I could organize for him, him to give you a call or I can give you his number. I'll even let him know that you'll call him. Um, and also, you know, like at any, you know, any stage, you know, that you need me, I'm, I'm here. I'll even actually, you know, if it's okay, I'll even give you a call maybe in a week's time to see how you go with Peter. Okay. And so like, it's that wow factor. So that's, that person's going to go, Oh, wow. I mean, number one, you know, relationships over revenue. Yeah. And then second thing is that you've, you've done that person a favor. They're going to like, if they, whether they need a chiropractor or not, they're going to, they're going to refer their friends, um, you know, and their family to you. So yeah. the trust factor in that is yeah. I had that exact same experience, yeah. maybe almost 12 months ago with a, mm place here in Melbourne called Factory Sound. I wanted to go and get a microphone and a couple other things for the podcast. And so I, I kind of went in there. I'd done a bit of research beforehand and said, look, I, here's exactly what I want. And the guy, and it's this place there, Billy, is just, if you kind of like roadie muso nerds, you know, there's yeah. 
like you know so much flannel beards mustaches the whole kind of thing going on there too and this guy said to me tell me like what are your needs what are you trying to do i explained yeah. to him he to ask took some questions about my computer and he yeah. said dude buying that microphone and getting that set up he said your computer can't keep up with that it's a complete waste of money he said mm -hmm. you've got the very best you can have at the moment and until you're prepared to kind of upgrade your computer that's not going to work for you now yeah. I was in there, I had my card already to spend 1500 bucks with me and I walked out of there having spent none of it. Yeah. The interesting thing is I tell everybody about that experience. I've sent so many people to Factory Sound and I'm waiting now, any moment my new computer comes, which you and I were talking about before and some things I'll be able to upgrade mm -hmm. and I'll be straight back to them and I'll have my yeah. money there ready for them to, yeah. to you know, the, the trust. And it is the currency I think that is missing more than, anything nowadays is yeah. that we lack trust particularly if we're starting to build a relationship with people online mm. or in, in any format that is as well i love that concept yeah. there too nice. Good. and then what about it so it, it i guess that's really what it is when we talk about you know the biggest mistakes that people are making in that kind of retention department one yeah. of those is that relationships over revenue but are there other yeah. things that kind of pop up that are really you know costing people their attention well, I, I, well number one i think that having systems in place that you you know regularly connect with your with your patients and your clients you know that they, they like you know more often than not uh we'd rather not see this you know and certainly with your clients and our and my clients that we want this to happen or, you know that it's not just a transaction it's not that once you convert them and that's it you know that and they pay you and then they're coming in it's actually look you're you're putting your health in, in my hands and, and trust and we want to build this relationship and along that journey uh you know like we want to try and sort of continue that relationship and you know keep building on it and i remember um uh, and it goes to show that like i i do watch your i do watch your stuff <laughs> and i do i um i remember that you had a, a post i think it may have been um on instagram or something like that um when the first sort of first spike of the COVID hit Australia, you know, in Melbourne, and that you said that um, that it nearly brought you to tears because you had, uh, you know, that you know you, you spoke to a client and basically, you know, that you were letting the people letting people know that like you were just, hey, are you okay? Like, do you, do you, mm -hmm. do you need do you need anything? Do you need food? Like, you know, look, it's like, do you need help or like, you know, let me know. Like, you know, if I can help, I'll help you. I'm obviously, if you say you want a Ferrari, you know, that, you know, but but, um, but like, let me know. And I think that that as healthcare practitioners, we sometimes forget that we are also human, and the people that we take care of are also human. Yeah. And yes, we need to be professional. We need to provide safe, effective care that is, you know, that's that's going to help them. And and and, it, and we are. We still need to hold that the line of being professional. But it doesn't stop us being human. It doesn't stop us going. You know what? Hey, let's put aside. Let's put aside the actual clinical, you know, stuff that we do, and go. Hey, you okay? You know, is there anything I can help you with? You know, is there anything that look? Um, and I, and one thing that you 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 do a lot of, and I think that you know we all do, and that is that if someone, if we know of someone, you know, that has a success or something's happened, or or even like something sad, like you know, if someone's if someone's family member has passed away, or if their if their child got into the got into the hockey, um, you know, a team they wanted to and that kind of stuff. And you know, or your, your staff and your reception know, send them a card, give them a call. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, you know, this is Dr. Angus. Just want to, just want to let you know how, how proud I am of you, you know, you guys, you know, getting into the soccer, blah, blah, or it could be, um, you know, that like, you know, condolences that, you know, your passing of your grandmother. And sometimes we could also like, you know, if reception staff, have notes and they find out that you know someone so if, if betty rings up and she says like i can't see angus today because you know i've got to take my cat to the, the vet your cas your receptionist um your admin staff not make, make a note and then tell you and then you write a card and you say hey betty i heard that you know i heard that you know that uh, that um that your cat had to go to the vet so what, just hoping that you know, he or she's okay let me know if there's anything i can do uh, you know um you know whatever it's something like that mm. You can't go wrong, and then, like it's it's stuff like that that builds retention and builds lifetime. It's you know if uh, like, yeah at the, at the end of the day, um, and and actually a book that I recently read as well is um is Talk Triggers by Jay Bear, right? Um, so Talk Triggers, and he's and he talks about that um uh, like it, it's competency doesn't cause conversations, and what he talks about is that you know in twenty twenty the the consumer they're like if they google search chiropractor port melbourne 
and there's four chiropractors that come up on the top of the search, the consumer basically knows like that the, those four chiropractors, they're competent. They, you know, they must have gone through their course, graduated, you know, more than likely if they're, they're, they'd have to be an APRA registered, you know, chiropractor. Yeah. So that's not going to, that's no longer anything like, you know, your competency is the basic, like that's like, that's a given. It's what else that you provide for your clients that like, you know, makes you, you know, just, you know, up there and better than your competitors. Yeah. Mm. It's so, because there's such a tendency and if I watch, of the kind of conversations that so many um, uh, practice management type companies are having. It's how to do the initial consultation, how to do the right report of findings. Mm -hmm. And everything is so front loaded. You know, those first phases, lead generation, yeah. new patient onboarding there too. Yeah. It's, it's often the sexy part of things, but mm -hmm. very few are talking about, you know, how to do a world-class consultation yeah. you know re-report of findings re-exams how to kind of keep them going through and we're looking for again these magnificent moments to acknowledge our patients maybe when they refer somebody mm. we had a big brainstorming inside the community info members recently of all the different ways that we could reward and acknowledge our patients as well and they're right the things that we were talking about were not we're in around the little things, you know, the animal to yeah. the vet, the loved ones yeah. having challenge, you know, winning soccer matches, all those kind of things like that too. And um, there is, it's one of my frustrations with marketing is that everybody wants to, you know, look at the first few steps, but great re relationships mm. don't come from the first date. That's not what nails no. up for us. We need to kind yeah. of keep on really flowing through into that. Um, Absolutely. As, as, as well so where do you think because you've picked out kind of three different hats there as well in terms of lead generation onboarding relationships as well one of the other things i've been kind of thinking about a lot recently is the hat that we need to have on that it might come under the umbrella of kind of hr managing staff mm -hmm. employing staff all that kind of stuff as as well what's your thoughts on that and what do you see with the people that you're chatting with that's yeah. That's that's definitely another important um, department. Absolutely, uh, and especially you know, an effective team can make all the difference. Uh, and if you think about like the client journey, if if the if you have a staff member, whether it be a receptionist, a chiropractic assistant, or a practice manager, or multiple, you know, a, a team that has multiple practitioners, that every one of those has to really be. Um, you know, in collaboration. And, and, I, and I use the word collaboration because often collaboration is external. So we like, we often talk about, we collaborate with, with, you know, people, network with people. We might collaborate with another business, but collaboration is also really important internally. And that is that, you know, that, that each person has their role, but that, you know, each person also has to collaborate their role with the other roles that are in that, you know, in the business. And so, you know, if I'm, if I'm someone that, exactly what we just said before that you know i might be just the person that takes the phone calls makes the bookings makes the payments reschedules people but i also need to be in a situation where i collaborate with the doctor with the chiropractor with the physio with the naturopath um and go you know what betty's mother passed away you know that was that was the reason why she you know she uh missed her, or missed her appointment what can we do what, what can we do to help you know or it could be um hey look uh I know, I've noticed I've noticed that you know that you've been so busy um, you know taking care of your clients you know you know whatever um, you've fallen fallen down on on um, on some of your sort of phone calls and your note taking like let's get like so I think that you know that it, I think also gone are the days where there's that hierarchy of you know I'm the boss and I and then I think that that there shouldn't be a hierarchy that that yes there has to be a boss that sort of makes the decisions and pays the bills and everything else. But to have like almost this thing where every team member, their input and their kind of accountability and their collaborative sort of relationships they can do within and also um, externally, they make a difference to the whole running of the business and the success of the business. Mm. There'll be some listeners, buddy, as they're working their way through this that are probably going, man, now there's a whole bunch more that I need to do. Like <laughs> I felt busy and overwhelmed beforehand. And yeah. now I'm, you know, Billy's telling me that there's at least three and maybe four more hats that I need to wear <laughs> that I wasn't even aware of. How do we not go into overwhelm with this? How do we get it all done and, and manage this? Oh, that's a hard question, isn't it? Because 
you know, as a business owner, I think that the you know it, it you have to you have to deal with it. And there's no, I guess I could I could sugarcoat things and go, you know what, like you know, like let's just start small and let's just kind of like don't dive like this test the waters. Mm. At the end of the day, the success of your business really, really is like you know like it's directly you know related to how well you understand where your where things are working where things aren't and how to make those things work better and more efficient okay there's three things that uh that healthcare practitioners that business owners um in the healthcare space have a limited amount of and that is money in terms of you know their marketing dollars you know like you know i mean even even the big corporations they they can't like you know um if the marketing department at, um, at at Apple uses up all their money, they can't go to the R and D department and go, "Oh, can we borrow some of your budget?" You know, if you like, you know, they'd be mm. like, "No, like we're all set budgets." So, you know, we have a limited amount of money, limited amount of human resources, and time, and yeah. so we need to make sure that we maximize those three. Okay, and so if you look at if you look at okay, this is the most simplest thing. If you look at the money time first, okay. All right, you're putting this much money into your lead generation and marketing. Like, how is that working? You know, like, you know, are you getting leads? You know, you know, what's the return on investment with that? Now, we all know, and as we spoke about earlier, we have to give it some time. So we can't expect that after a month or two or three that we're going to get a massive return on investment. We have to put in the effort and the consistency with our marketing and lead generation. But then also with you know, with what you're doing with the you know, you know onboarding your clients and processing them and converting them to clients. You know what? So your t- your money that you're spending there, like, do you have the resources there as well, and so forth? And the same with well, same with human resources. Are you putting the time and effort in those, and also the t- you know the, the actual time itself? You know, are you allocating enough time to all those departments? And I think that the 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 easiest way to say say the, um, say Angus is, you have to have your hats on for a successful business. You can't go like it's yeah. as I said. I can't sort of say there's an easy way out, but the but one of the things is keep keep some stats. I think that's important because you might find that the, the, the downturn in your revenue and your patient numbers could be that you've got a leaky bucket and just fixing the leaky bucket could actually bring your stats back up and your revenue back up. You know? Yeah. I think it's an interesting thing because I, I, I hear this all the time from mm. people that I work with. I just don't have time for this stuff. And it's a really interesting thing because then I ask them, well, what, what, like, what's your contact hours? Oh, I work three and a half days a week. Yeah. Like, really? Come yeah. on, man. Yeah. Like so few of us, um, you know, I, I, I've got, um, you know, buddies of mine who are, you know, lawyers and they laugh at us. Like yeah. you and your three, three and a half days. I mean, they're in their early years there when they're going through getting stuff, you know, that, and it's not healthy. I'm not suggesting we should be working 60 and 70 hour weeks, mm. but we need to put in the time. And so for those of you that might be in more established practices and maybe you are working a lot of hours and those kind of things there too, then, you know, there might be room for you to outsource some of this, mm. you know, speed this process up by, you know, rather than working out how to do it, finding out who can do this with me or, or, or for me as well. But it's it's interesting, more times than not, when people come back to me with this concept, if I don't have the time with that too, there's yeah. a hell of a lot of time they're spending screwing around doing other bits and pieces in there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I mean, not- I was actually just on a, on a call with a client this morning and, um, and we're going through some of these things about overwhelm with time and everything else. And I, and, and I said, look, uh, and he was like going, Oh, well, like I've, I've had a big day. I've had like a chocker day. And now like, I've got a list of things I want to do, but I just feel like, like just sitting down, having some food and watching some TV. And I was like, allow yourself for that. Like, you know, that, that's okay. Yeah. You know, like you've had a big day. Like, I, I actually think that it's probably like, you know, unless, unless you have to have to do it because it's a deadline or, you know, you're going to get in massive trouble with a bass or something like that or get fined. I think that just allow yourself to chill. Okay. Don't, don't do any work. Don't think about any work. Enjoy. Watch some TV, watch, you know, you know, you go and have a drink, whatever. Um, but when it comes to actually then the next day and you've allocated like an hour or two hours to do something, then you better actually sit down there and do it. Mm. And I use this analogy talking about lawyers, like, you know, uh, you, you've got clients all over the world, but like in Australia, um, like, like law, I've, got, I've got a family friends that are family relatives of lawyers. They, they charge at six minute intervals. So yeah. 
Yeah, so they have like this log this computer program that when they're you know doing stuff, it kind of logs six minutes. Okay. Now, what would it be like if you asked your lawyer, um, oh, can you just write me this paragraph, like a small email to this thing, because I need sort of that. And he goes, Yeah, cool. And then you get the bill, and the bill's four grand. Okay. And you know, you know that it's six minute intervals, right? And so you go six minutes divided into four grand, right? Um, so like like all I asked was a paragraph. You'd be like, "That's you. You can't. That's that's you know. You, you're you're ripping me off." And we do this to ourselves. Like we we say that we're going to go. Look, I want to I want to organize some marketing, or I want to organize some articles, or a blog, or a post, or I want to do this, or hey, I want to look at my stats for you know. And then we sit there, and then we start scrolling, and then we go, "Oh, and then the Bing." Like you know, a message message comes in, and then yes. we and then we have a look, and then the, a, a, an email comes in, and then the email has a link, and we click, click on the link, and the link takes us to another website, and then we go, oh wow, that's kind of cool, like whatever. And so, at the end of that hour, we go, oh, and we're really down the dumps with ourselves, like oh, I didn't get to finish that thing, and mm -hmm. that's basically what we're doing. We're actually short selling ourselves, but we're also not valuing our own our own like time. So we're basically selling a four thousand dollar bill to, to like a lawyer when i only yeah. did like half an hour of work yeah yeah i i, I love that concept and yeah. you know i think for many practitioners one of the number one things they could do is just learn some really basic time management yeah i understand the concept of switch tasking versus multitasking work out what time of the day they're most productive mm. you know i very rarely leave any difficult work for after 3 p.m in the day afternoon it's just not going to happen i, I will yeah. do low value tasks then um, I need to get it all done in the morning. That's when I'm at my most productive. I break it down into little 50 minute work slots. I set the timer on my watch. <clears throat> when it finishes, I'm allowed five minutes. And really, to be honest, I can get kind of three of those solid 50 minute blocks done um, mm. in a day. And then after that, it starts to kind of spiral down. <clears throat> but I can get a lot done in those 50 minutes. And yeah. so if you're feeling like you don't have a lot of time, then rather than maybe even first jumping into all these things we spoke about today, then some good kind of time management processes um, might be worth looking at. Hey, buddy, of our listeners, our gorgeous, wonderful listeners, if they're wanting to find out a little bit more about you and the work you do and the coaching um, as well, where's the best spot for them to, to have a look? Um, it's www.billychow for uh, president. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Excellent. I was excited then. I'm like, <laughs> no, oh, yes. um, they, they can go to uh, www.blackdiamondclub. So B-L-A-C-K, blackdiamondclub.com. Um, there's information on there. Um, or they can just um, find me on, you know, on, um, you know, on Facebook or social media, message me or whatever. Um, What's your current like, Insta yeah. handle at the moment? It was for a while there. It was changing almost on a weekly basis. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It's um, well, I, well, because, uh, I was I was late I was late to getting my name on there so I am the Billy Chow on Instagram of course Insta. the of Billy course. Chow yeah well, that's how I introduce you to most people as well so yeah. it would make sense that your Instagram handle yeah. would be the same yeah. so yeah. hey buddy always a wonderful pleasure um, to chat with you thanks so much for sharing that as as well Thank you. I know our listeners will get a bunch out of that to start to think about you know where the, could they improve and perhaps run a little bit of an audit of their practice um, as well. Mm. Until Oh, brother thanks for all that you do as well and for oh, our listeners out there keep saving lives your communities really need you see you soon man bye if you enjoyed listening to this podcast you have to come and check out the community influencer program it's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and i'll work one-on-one -on -one with you to apply implement systematize and help guide you and your practice to the next level now you can join me on over at adiomedia.com forward slash join. That's adiomedia.com forward slash join. I'd love to see you in there.